Hello, my name is April Breuer and I'm a student registered nurse anesthetist at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh DNP Nurse Anesthesia Emphasis Program. I have been a registered nurse for over 10 years with the majority of my nursing background in critical care and lung transplant. Today I will be discussing the key points of anesthetic management of robotic and open prostatectomy surgery and my goal is to provide education for other SRNAs and CRNAs that are currently in practice with some basic knowledge for managing this unique population in the operating room. Nearly all prostatectomies are for adenocarcinoma of the prostate, and prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in most countries. This disease is more common among aging men versus a disease that affects the young male population. Patients may have already also had chemo or radiation treatments prior to coming to the operating room. There are also some differences between simple versus radical prostatectomy. So a simple prostatectomy is not as common of a procedure anymore due to the advancement of alpha-1 adrenergic inhibitors and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Overall, simple prostatectomy is associated with less blood loss and lower complication rates in addition to lower pain scores. A radical prostatectomy involves the removal of the entire prostate gland, seminal vesicles, in addition to the surrounding nerves and veins. And part of the urethra within the prostate gland's transition, transition zone is also removed. When planning our anesthetic, we need to consider the patient's other comorbidities as well as assess for prior chemo and radiation treatments. It is important to ask when the last radiation or chemo treatment was administered, if applicable, as many chemotherapeutic agents have secondary effects on other organ systems. Patients for presenting for this procedure are often elderly with pre-existing conditions such as coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, CHF, COPD, and renal impairment. We should anticipate renal impairment not only because of the comorbidities or because this is a surgery that is typically performed on the aging population, but because renal impairment secondary to chronic obstruction may be present, therefore making it prudent to assess renal function and electrolytes in the preoperative period. Additionally, a type and cross should be drawn for prostate glands that are greater than 30 grams in weight, as there is an increased risk of bleeding with prostates that are larger in size. Preoperative testing is largely dictated on the patient's underlying coexisting diseases. If the patient has cardiac disease, for example, they should have an EKG or an echo performed. Or in a patient with chronic lung disease, we should be looking at PFTs for the patient. Typical labs that should be assessed on nearly all of these patients include a BMP, paying particular attention to renal function and electrolytes, a CBC to establish a pre-op hematocrit in addition to determining the patient's platelet count if a neuraxial anesthetic approach is going to be utilized, and a type and cross as previously mentioned. Other labs should be drawn on an individual basis as dictated by the patient's other underlying comorbidities. And here are some general intraoperative considerations for patients undergoing prostatectomy surgery. So there is a potential for venous air emboli, um, and this may occur due to a breach of the prostatic venous plexus, and this is more common, obviously, in open approaches. This surgery is considered to be fairly painful, especially for open radical approaches, and pain control is best achieved by a multimodal approach. There is now an ERAS protocol for these procedures at various organizations. The anesthesia provider also needs to consider the fact that open prostatectomy may result in moderate to large blood loss, with approximately 10% of patients requiring a blood transfusion during the case. This potentially necessitates two or more peripheral IVs. I feel that having additional access is particularly important in robotic cases, where the patient's arms are tucked and the anesthesia provider does not have the ability to start an additional IV during the case. What I have found helpful in robotic prostatectomy cases is starting a second IV in one arm with a fluid warmer and normal saline with blood tubing, while the other IV is the flush line where I put all of my medications through. Then in the event of large blood loss and the, and the need to transfuse blood, or if a fluid bolus is required, it's already primed through a warmer and ready to go. If the case is expected to result in a large blood loss, the anesthesia provider should have a cell salvage system prepared. And lastly, monitoring for these patients includes standard ASA monitoring, and then it goes up from there with more invasive monitoring warranted for patients with underlying comorbidities, such as an arterial line, a CVL, as well as a Foley catheter. And this should be standard in nearly all of these patients to monitor for urinary output, especially because most of these patients do have renal impairment. We also need to titrate fluids very carefully as overhydration can distort anatomical surgical landmarks and lead to profound fluid shifts.
Appropriate anesthetic techniques for open prostatectomy include neuraxial, such as spinal or epidural, general anesthesia, or a combined technique. The optimal block level for a regional technique is T8 to T10, depending on the incision site. Regional anesthetic techniques are associated with higher fluid requirements because of sympathectomy and vasodilation, but may provide for lower blood loss than general anesthesia. Something to bear in mind as the anesthesia provider is that surgery may last longer than the spinal duration, so always have a backup plan in case this were to happen. There is the potential for large blood loss in these procedures, and typical EBL is 500 to 1500 mLs. Open prostatectomy is considered a painful surgery, so you might want to consider a low thoracic epidural for analgesic management and multimodal analgesics. The positioning for this procedure is supine for simple or lithotomy for a radical open prostatectomy. Robotic approaches to prostatectomy are gaining popularity due to less pain, shorter length of stay, faster recovery, and increased patient satisfaction. The required anesthetic technique is a general endotracheal tube anesthetic with neuromuscular blockade. Many of the complications related to the robotic approach is due to the lithotomy and steep Trendelenburg position that is required for the surgery. Some of these complications include an increase in ICP and intraocular pressure. The patient should also be considered for antacid therapy, a prokinetic, and an intraoperative OG tube as the increased, there is an increased reflux risk in the steep Trendelenburg position. And some patients just simply are unable to tolerate steep Trendelenburg due to hemodynamic, cardiac, or pulmonary issues. As it relates to pulmonary issues, there is an encroachment of abdominal contents onto the diaphragm in this position, and this has significant effects on the respiratory function, especially in obese patients. This includes reduction in functional residual capacity, vital capacity, and overall lung compliance, which translates into the need for higher peak airway pressures for equivalent tidal volumes. Additionally, obese patients experience greater ventilation perfusion mismatching in the steep Trendelenburg position. During these surgical approaches, it is important to consider all things that may affect the patient from the positioning, CO2 insufflation, and the underlying comorbidities. Because of the possibility of an increased ICP in this position, it's extremely important to have an accurate neurologic assessment prior to surgery with a pre-op neurosurgical consult for patients that have intracranial lesions or VP shunts present. There is a higher rate of neurologic injury with the lithotomy and steep Trendelenburg positioning, and the risk is particularly increased when the surgery lasts greater than three hours. Prolonged lithotomy position predisposes the patient to lower and sometimes upper extremity nerve injury, particularly the femoral nerve. Pressure areas and compartment syndrome of the lower limbs may also result as a result of the lithotomy position. Prolonged Trendelenburg positioning predisposes the patient to ocular injury, such as ischemic optic neuropathy that is caused by high intraocular pressures, laryngeal and facial edema, and respiratory distress. It is important to check endotracheal tube placement after positioning, as a right main stem intubation is common in steep Trendelenburg. Additionally, the pulse oximeter probe should be placed anywhere but the earlobe, as placement on the earlobe may lead to inaccurate readings in this location. This is thought to be related to the venous engorgement with Trendelenburg positioning and pneumoperitoneum. And because exaggerated Trendelenburg positioning is required for the procedure, some providers deliberately avoid dosing epidural catheters to avoid cephalad spread of epidural drugs during the procedure. An additional consideration for this is that the, these surgeries tend to last a long time, oftentimes lasting two or more hours. And we also have to consider the fact that pneumoperitoneum from insufflation results in decreased renal blood flow in these patients who already have underlying baseline or underlying renal impairment, and this may lead to decreased urinary output in these patients. Basic general post-op considerations include assessing the patient for a positioning injury, which is especially important in robotic cases that tend to have a long duration. We also need to assess these patients for airway edema, which is also particular to robotic cases from steep Trendelenburg positioning. And we need to consider post-op pain. So in these patients, particularly for open prostatectomies, we should consider an epidural infusion of dilute local anesthetics with opioids or PCA. Additionally, tap blocks and rectus sheath catheters have been used for post-op analgesia in these patients. 
Rarely these patients require ICU admission, but depending on the patient's past medical history, ICU admission may be warranted.